Okay, this is part one. This is diastology demystified. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about the physiology of diastole first. And we're not going to go through this. It's the official rule book of echocardiography is produced for you here. The American Society of Echocardiography has a great guideline about diastolic function and dysfunction and beautiful algorithms for understanding whether or not diastolic dysfunction is present and grading it. Not all that applies in the ICU. In fact, for me, understanding diastole in the ICU is really all about answering two fundamental questions. Number one, is diastolic dysfunction present? And number two, is my left atrial pressure high? And that second question is so critical when we're managing patients with heart failure, respiratory failure. This is the new swan. I can use my echo probe to estimate a left atrial pressure. I don't need to sink a swan anymore and measure a wedge. So uh, as long as I can get good windows and get good ma measurements and hemodynamics, uh, this is absolutely one of the best things to do in the ICU is understand how diastolic function works. So this is your uh, pressure volume loop. This is a normal pressure volume a curve for the left ventricle. So we're going to review a basic physiology here. Diastole is this portion on the left. Uh, so this is your isovolumic relaxation. That's where the pressure in the left ventricle is rapidly falling before any blood enters the chamber. Then the mitral valve will open. And then of course diastole is actually comprised of several phases. Uh, but we're going to start by just talking about early rapid filling and atrial kick because these are the two major movements in blood flow that we're going to measure uh, when we're using the echo probe. I've put here the curves, these are the actual waveforms. If you were to measure left ventricular pressure in the, uh, through a catheter, this is what it would look like uh, du during diastole. So the pressure um, will rise a little bit first, then kind of stay stagnant, and then with the atrial kick it rises. Most of your filling is during early rapid filling, some during diastasis, uh, but very minimal, and then there's a big atrial kick that gives you another 25-30% of your blood volume in health. So this diagram is absolutely critical to understanding diastology with the echo probe. So again, I've reproduced the curve. We're looking at diastole, early rapid filling, and the atrial kick. And when we talk about how the left ventricle fills, we look at two major forces that cause the blood to push in and to uh, fill the left ventricle. The first is called the push function or the lengthening load. And that is determined by the left atrial to left ventricular pressure gradient. So simple physics, I suppose, left atrial pressure is high, it's going to push the left ventricle open when the mitral valve opens up. That's called the push function. The other major force is called the pull function or the restoring force. This is what is created by active left ventricular relaxation or suction. And in health, this is the predominant force that causes the left ventricle to fill. In fact, it's, it accounts for almost all of the reason that the left ventricle fills. But when patients start to develop left ventricular or left atrial pathology, the push function becomes increasingly important. And ultimately, when people have really high left atrial pressures, it's the push function that starts to predominate. And we'll continue to revisit that, but just recognize there are two major reasons the left ventricle fills. There is the pull function, the active relaxation of the myocardium, and then there's the push function, the pushing of blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. All right, so if we're going to do this with a Doppler probe, we're going to have to get an apical four-chamber view or two-chamber view. Uh, I've just kind of simplified the schematic here. Let's say this is actually a four-chamber view. I'm going to put my Doppler at my apex. Uh, I'm going to put on pulse wave Doppler because that's what I want to do. I want to sample this blood volume here. And this is, what you want, this is about where you want to put it, just beyond the mitral valve uh, leaflet tips. Put your uh, sample area right there and pulse wave Doppler. I'm only interested in blood flow coming through the mitral valve at this location. And I want it as close to that location as possible without getting the valves because I want to get the maximal velocities through here. And when I'm measuring a pulse wave Doppler, I'm actually going to pick up exactly what you see here. The early rapid filling, which is going to be my E wave, conveniently label, uh, labeled E. And then I'm going to have my atrial kick, which is my A wave. I don't know if this is actually what E and A stand for, but that's how I remember it. Your E is your early rapid filling, your A is your atrial kick. Pulse wave Doppler there, that's what you're measuring. Blood flow from left atrium to left ventricle occurring in two big waves. Early rapid filling and an atrial kick. So let's talk about each of these waves. The E wave is measured at peak velocity, and it's dependent on both push and pull. Now in health, which one is it? Pull, exactly, it's the pull in health. So in health, the left ventricular relaxation is the predominant force, and that is what accounts for most of your E velocity. So left ventricle rapidly empty, or sorry, rapidly relaxes and opens, left atrium rapidly empties, so you're gonna get a big gush of blood flow. Your E velocity is gonna be higher in health and it's going to be more dependent on the pull. 
As we start to talk about diastolic dysfunction, you'll see that this left atrial to left, ventric left ventricular pressure gradient, the push, is what's going to end up accounting for most of the e-velocity. So those are the two major factors that determine my e-velocity. How is my a velocity different? Well, it's slightly different in that my a wave is measured also at peak velocity, but my a wave depends on a few different parameters. First, it depends on left atrial contractile force, right? So now, um, when left atrium is contracting during late diastole, that force is going to provide some of the atrial kick. And obviously, you'll recognize when people have long-standing diastolic dysfunction, the left atrium enlarges, and that kick may be slightly higher. So that may make the A velocity higher in some diastolic dysfunction states. Now, because my left ventricle is no longer relaxing, it's the actual compliance, the stiffness, the elastins, however you want to think about it, that is going to affect my left atrial velocity. So the early phase, it's the active relaxation. That's a metabolically active process when the muscle is relaxing. But later, it's the stiffness, which is you can think about as some degree of fibrosis, other things that would cause the left ventricular chamber to have reduced compliance or increased elastance. Um, those are going to be uh, critical to determining my A velocity. And then the left H to the left ventricular pressure gradient is also in play here, but much less so than the E velocity. So it's not a big player here in determining the A velocity. So before we move on, I want to talk about a couple of other measures of the diastole that may be of interest to you. Um, but are not things I routinely do in the ICU unless I'm confused about a patient's diastolic function. The first um, thing we need to do to get these other measures is actually switch over to continuous wave Doppler because now I want to pick up not only my mitral inflow signal, but I also want to get some of that left ventricular outflow track signal here. So I want to get the blood flow rushing into the left ventricle and rushing out. Because from that, I'll be able to see when systole is occurring, which is going to be away from the probe, and then when diastole is occurring, which is going to be the blood flow toward the probe, which, as you'll see materialize here in a moment, is going to be my E and my A wave. So if I throw a continuous wave Doppler just off to the side of the mitral valve, I'll pick up both of these signals. So I'm going to get this systolic flow away from the probe, and then I'm going to get my inflow velocities toward the probe. So the first measure of interest is actually my isovolumic relaxation time. So we've kind of glossed over this. This is the early diastolic phenomenon. Um, and I can actually measure that with my continuous wave Doppler. If I pick up my LVOT signal, and I have a break between when the mitral blood starts, uh, mitral blood flow starts occurring, or the transmitral valve blood flow. That's my intro. Uh, that's sorry. That's my isovolumic relaxation time. That's the space between here. And as we'll see with early diastolic dysfunction, this starts to get longer because the ventricle is taking longer time to open. However, when left atrial pressure gets really high, this will ultimately shorten because my left atrial pressure is so high it's going to pop my mitral valve open early. We'll revisit that. But just recognize that we're able to rec we're actually able to directly measure isovolumic relaxation time. The other thing we can measure is what's called deceleration time. Do I routinely do this? No. But if you want to think about diastology like a cardiologist, it's helpful to understand these parameters. So the deceleration time is simply how long it takes that E velocity uh, to slow down, how long it takes the early rapid filling blood to sort of achieve its max velocity and slow down. And again, early diastolic dysfunction, this will lengthen because my left ventricle is slowly expanding and it's slowly going to accommodate that blood. But when it gets left atrial pressure gets really high, it's going to pop open and pop close right away. So the deceleration time is actually going to fall back short again as diastolic dysfunction worsens. It's really interesting physiology. So deceleration time is another measure of my left ventricular stiffness or compliance. We said the A velocity was reflective of compliance. So is this deceleration time. Because at this point, my myocardium is no longer really actively relaxing. It's really the stiffness or compliance that's going to uh, determine this deceleration time. All right. So we've talked a lot about transmitral blood flow velocities. And that's all with continuous and pulse wave Doppler. Now we're going to talk about tissue Doppler, which is the other huge ingredient to understanding diastolic function in your patients. And in order to do that, we're going to use our tissue Doppler. Now remember, tissue Doppler is used to measure myocardial velocity. So it's going to block out all the blood flow signals and only going to look at low moving, slow moving structures, which is like your myocardium. Now for this, I have my lateral uh, myocardium that I'm measuring here. This is right at the mitral valve uh, apparatus. I'm going to be measuring the myocardium. And you'll see some actual echo video of this, uh, of this in a moment. So I'm going to put my tissue Doppler uh, right over that area. And what I'm going to do is measure myocardial velocity. And what's interesting is I'm going to get reflected waves in the myocardium in the opposite direction because my left ventricle is going to relax away from the probe. As the LV opens and accommodates the blood, it's going to expand. 
but the two major reflections I'm going to get in myocardial movement are reflective of the early rapid filling and the atrial kick. So we call them E prime and A prime. They're the tissue Doppler equivalents of my E and my A wave. So the absolute magnitude or the absolute value of my E prime reflects my higher degree of active myocardial relaxation. So in other words, my E prime is my most sensitive and specific marker of left ventricular myocardial relaxation, the metabolically active component of diastole. So that is my major marker of diastolic function. If the myocardium is relaxing quickly, the left ventricle is healthy. It's actively opening in, a, uh, in an appropriate manner. If this E prime velocity is slow, or the absolute magnitude is low, that means I have diastolic dysfunction. My left ventricle is not relaxing as fast as it should be. Now again, if you want to impress your cardiology friends, you can talk about some of these other physiologic correlates of E prime. Um, LV relaxation, time constant is a way, another way to measure LV relaxation. You can do that um, through pressure transduction of left ventricular pressures. Uh, there's a formula for that. I don't even remember it. Uh, but E prime is sort of considered an equivalent to that. Uh, the other thing about E prime is that it's somewhat load independent. Um, so when you're measuring your E prime velocity, you really can think about it as if you're just, you are just measuring myocardial relaxation forces. So this, is, this means that even if my left atrial pressure is low or high, when I'm looking at E prime, I am really mostly looking at myocardial relaxation, the muscle itself. And that's all point three here is, re is restating the same thing, that the myocardial restoring forces, the pull, predominates over the filling pressure push when I'm measuring my E prime. So my E prime is predominantly a reflection of my pull function, active open relaxation left ventricle, and not my push function. Okay, have I bored you enough with physiology yet? So, um, I've said this again, uh, E prime is considered the most sensitive marker uh, of diastolic dysfunction. So again, myocardial relaxation, best marker for that. Here's some normal values. Uh, the one that I use the most is the lateral. It's easy to remember, 10 centimeters per second. So a normal lateral E prime should be 10, uh, greater than 10 centimeters per second. And that's an absolute value. The actual number is going to be negative, but uh, when you get a velocity, it's going to be reported as positive. Okay. So let's put these two pieces of information together because you actually are going to be measuring both. You're going to be doing a pulse wave Doppler to get these inflow velocities, and then you're going to be doing myocardial tissue Doppler. And you're going to get this first. You're going to get your diastolic parameters, uh, your E and your A wave first, and you might get a fast E wave. And you might ask yourself, is E high because of the push or the pull? Is there a high left atrial left ventricular pressure gradient, or is there just vigorous relaxation? Because I can get the same profile, the same E and A profile in a young, healthy person or a person with an old, stiff ventricle. So I can see this in both patients, but the question is why, and here is why. So let's just take an example. I have a, get these two E and A wave velocities from my mitral inflow velocity pulse wave Doppler, E90, A50. So I have some pretty fast flow from left, left atrium left ventricle. If you do this enough, you'll recognize the E velocity of 90 is pretty high. Well, why is that the case? Well, here's one patient. If I had an athlete run a race, young, healthy, vigorously relaxing heart, I might actually get an E prime velocity of somewhere in the neighborhood of 18, which means that my E velocity is only high because of my pull force. So when I do the ratio of E to E prime, that is helping me understand how much is pull and how much is push. In other words, E to E prime is a reflection of left atrial pressure. So in this athlete, I have a high E velocity because my E prime is high which means I have a high pull force. So when I look at the ratio, this ratio is considered low. Left atrial pressure is normal. My E velocity is only high because of a strong pull function. Contrast that to an elderly patient with a HEFPEF, and you might get the same Doppler inflow velocity pattern of 90 and 50 for your E and your A, but the patient's E prime velocity may be as low as five. In that situation, my E to E prime is 18, which means I have a high left atrial pressure and my high E is actually due to the push force. The left atrial hypertension is driving the E velocity. Because my myocardial relaxation is slow, it can't be the pull force, it has to be the push. So in health, a normal E to E prime is somewhere in this neighborhood. Less than 14, lateral, less than 12 to 13. Anything less than 10 is considered very good. So that means a normal left atrial pressure. Anything under 10 is a normal left atrial pressure, especially when you're measuring a lateral E to E prime ratio. So these would actually be pretty normal markers. A normal marker of, uh, these would be normal values. E of 50 in health, E prime somewhere around negative, four, or negative 14. 
Um, which again, it tells you that in health, pull predominates over push, right? E is not very fast. E prime is fast. The ratio is well under 10. Um, so pull is the predominant mechanism of E velocity in health. All right, let's end this section of physiology with a one simple question. Which of the following velocities is largely load independent and thus consider the most sensitive and specific for diagnosing diastolic dysfunction? Is it your A velocity, your E velocity, E prime velocity, your A prime velocity, or your TR jet velocity? Well, we didn't even talk about these last two, right? So I, uh, I don't even know what to do with A, velo a prime velocity. I've measured it. I, I think it's pretty useless. I've never seen what I'm actually supposed to do with that, uh, that measure. Um, so we can kind of eliminate these two, right? So it's actually my E prime velocity. I've said that a couple different ways. E prime velocity is mostly independent of left atrial pressure, i.e. it's load independent. So it's really just looking at myocardial relaxation. Thus, it is your best marker for diagnosing diastolic dysfunction.